welcome Reem to uh, this episode uh, of Matbakh, uh, Afikra Matbakh. Uh, Matbakh is a series um, of podcasts and conversations that um, really look into the history and the culture behind Arab food. Uh, we talk with uh, with chefs, uh, food study experts, uh, professors, and uh, movers and shakers from the food industry in the Arab world and in diaspora as well. Um, and for today's episode, I'm very, very excited to be having our conversation with Reem Asil. Uh, Reem uh, is a Palestinian Syrian chef based in Auckland, California. She is the owner of Reem's California, a nationally acclaimed restaurant that is inspired by her passion for Arab street corner bakeries and the vibrant communities that surround them. Barely a year after opening Reams in 2017, uh, Asil opened an Arab fine dining concept, the Alpha, in partnership with Alta Restaurant Group, earning it a place on the Michelin Guide and Bib Gourmand's list in its first year. Her book, uh, Arabiya, uh, Recipes from the Life of an Arab in Diaspora, was out just this past year, receiving grave reviews from the media. Um, and Reem has received the highest awards and nominations out there, including James Beard finalist and Outstanding Chef in 2022, uh, semi-finalist in the Best Chef in the West in 2018 and 2019, Thrillist's 2018 Chef of the Year, as well as San Francisco's Magazine 2018 Chef of the Year. Her restaurant, Dreams California, was named in Food and Wine's Top 10 New Restaurants of the Year for 2018, and she received the Auckland County Award for Small Business of the Year for her restaurant in 2019. Um, we'll talk more about uh, all that, about the achievements and the book in a little bit. Um, what it's like to run a restaurant in California and a little bit on the Arab food, as well as your work and passion for community um, work. Uh, but first, I'd like to welcome you, Reem. Welcome to Africa. Thanks for me. <laughs> I was cringe when my accolades come up. <laughs> <laughs> Always the case. But I want to start by asking, how has all this began for you? Um, how did you encounter the world of food? Yeah. Well, food, you know, for for anyone, uh, food is a cultural cultural relic. <laughs> um, it's an identifier of my Arab identity. I grew up uh, in a Palestinian Syrian household in a very, very small suburb of the U.S. And uh, it was quite the experience being the other we were but a handful of arabs in the um in the area that we were in and so food was always the way to stay connected to our culture so it always been there but i actually pursued a career not in food but in um community and labor organizing so i spent almost 20 years on the front line of um campaigns to fight for workers' rights and living wages, affordable housing, you name it. Um, and that brought me to California. And I sort of experienced this, um, this crossroads moment where I burnt out. Um, honestly, we were fighting the good fight. We were in the midst of a recession in 2008, and it just felt very tiring. We didn't, and I felt like we were losing sight of what we were fighting for. And so in uh, in any any time that I'm up against the crossroads, I always kind of retreat and try to go back to my roots. And I had this opportunity to go to the Arab world with my father. Um, to that point, we had been a little bit estranged. Um, and he said, I'm going to Syria and Lebanon. Do you want to come with me? And I told him, yeah, actually, I'm, you know, in this soul searching point of my life and if we go i want to see all of syria not just that would have been 2010 was, no that would yeah that was in 2010 correct yeah and uh 
I wanted to see all of it. Uh, he, he was from Damascus, and uh, but I knew that there was just so much more to the Arab world than what we were seeing. Um, and we went, and it was an amazing trip. We went up the coast of Syria and um, went to a lot of places that, unfortunately, because of the war, no longer exist. And um, it was there that I encountered the people and the food spaces and this sense of warmth and community and connection, this thing that I had been chasing and yearning for as a community organizer, building it for other people. Uh, I was like, oh, my people understand how to build community and connection and resilience. And so going back to my roots, I, I understood that food places, food spaces intentionally built could do that. So that's essentially how I got into food was to create that feeling that I felt going into the street corner bakeries in Lebanon, in Syria. Um, I, I vowed to figure out how to open my own bakery, but I knew that I needed to build the technical skills and, I came back in 2010 and essentially quit my job and enrolled myself into a culinary culinary school, which for any Arab immigrant parents was scared. They didn't know what I was doing as a nonprofit NGO <laughs> organizer. They certainly didn't know what I was doing with my life when I said, I'm going to... Uh, um, I'm going to learn how to be a baker, but I just became really obsessed with food and bread in particular as the lifeline of Arab history and the conduit to tell a story about Arabs, you know, and our resilience. Uh, so it kind of served me in two ways. It was healing for me personally as an Arab um, and also, you know, shining light on the Arab experience to Americans who didn't understand the cuisine, but also uh, a way to create connection with other communities. That's wonderful. And so much to unpack there. Um, what you said about them um, when you visited the food spaces and the food businesses, little shops or restaurants uh, in the street corners in Syria and Lebanon. And you you mentioned you felt what what you've been looking for or what you've been wanting to achieve, that sense of community. Um how different is that? Can can you tell us tell us a little bit more? How how different is it from what you've experienced? There is street food in the U.S., of course. There is street food in California. But how how does the the sense of community feels different? Yeah, I mean that's a really interesting question because if you think of you know the forces of imperialism. Uh, on the Arab world have created such a um, just uh, so much trauma, right? It's war and, and the fact that people can go back and find each other to build that resilience. And, and yet I think those same forces are responsible for the poverty um, that people are feeling here in the States, the disenfranchisement of black and brown communities, but different from um, the Arab world, I think here in the U.S., everybody has been pitted against one another and estranged. And uh, it's a, a lot about this individualist culture, this idea that you can get ahead on your own, um, which prevent people from really organizing because they've kind of they've been disenfranchised. Um, and so the individualism that I experienced here in the U.S. is much different than this collective struggle that I felt of people. Now, it's not perfect in the Arab world. There's a lot of nuance there, but um, I felt like in the communities that I work with and, and the communities I worked in were not Arab, mind you. Um, but if you go back to people's culture and their roots, it teaches this idea of connectivity, that we can rely on one another, that we can care for one another, that we don't need to rely on these forces to do that. And so that was a good reminder for me is like, how do we strengthen um, what it is that we were fighting for? Because what we're fighting against, we know is bad, but we also need to build the things that we want. Um, and I saw glimpses of it there in the Arab world, you know, going into these food spaces and people laughing and crying and celebrating and commiserating together, you wouldn't know that there was political turmoil outside those doors, even though there is. So that kind of idea of building um, 
the will to live, the will to thrive, the will to have joy, you know, that is through these food spaces, um, whether it's in the home or uh, in these, in these spaces. So I think that I really didn't see a lot of that here in the U S although I know certainly it exists. I just wanted to create it more intentionally to the ends of transforming society, right? Creating more liberatory spaces so that when people walked in, you know, for example, in my bakery, that they would walk out those doors and relate to the world in a different way, maybe. Mm. Or, um, so I wanted it to have a ripple effect. I knew that my bakery alone couldn't do that, but if I could show a model of this is what it could look like. But um, just to, to expand on your question, little to my um, knowledge, the restaurant industry here in the U.S. is very, very plagued um, with inequities and injustices. Uh, and so it was very hard to navigate this dream that I had to create it within those spaces. And I think, you know, I'm still trying, we're still trying to figure out the model that really centers the people who are making the food, the people who are growing the food, uh, you know, the narratives of our stories and the roots of that food. Um, but there's, you know, racism and capitalism and all these forces in the U.S. are alive and well. And that has certainly caused some challenges for us uh, at Reams to, to try to overcome. Yeah, I'm sure corporatization also, in a way, um, you know, created that dependency on um, on brands, chains, uh, big corporations that that are impersonable, <laughs> not that are a non-persons. You know, you don't see the community. You don't see the people working. You don't see, you know, the the person baking your bread or or farming your food, uh, or selling even as a you know as like mom and pop shops. Um, there are small businesses, but I think um, perhaps in the Arab world. Um, that 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 has definitely also been the case. I mean, there is a lot of that, uh, but perhaps the, the 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 pace of modernization hasn't caught up yeah. as, with that as much as it has been in the U.S. Yeah, and that's why I said I didn't want to romanticize because I I know that it was a novelty to me yearning for a connection to roots to see those yeah. places in a way, and I remember somebody from. Lebanon had come to my bakery and ate the manushe and he was like, oh my God, this is how it used to be done in Lebanon, yeah. which was very sad to me that like, you know, globalization and, and capitalism and poverty and all these forces have forced people to not be able to even uh, enjoy their own food waste. Um, so that yeah. feels like a very important fight on a global level to fight for food sovereignty. Um, but yeah, that made me sad. Like we are using sourdough starter. That's only what they do in the villages. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So kind of going back to our roots and mm -hmm. I think for Reams, um, what we're trying to do is walk the walk, not just talk to the talk. You know, I think that there are certain brands out there that, that talk about community, even restaurant, small mm -hmm. restaurants. But then you see their workers are not paid well. Um, you know, they're uh, they're not giving back to the community. They're not doing all these things that they say they are. So it's just fluff. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're we're trying to really show that if you actually invest in your employees and you invest in their knowledge of the food, and you and for us as Arabs, you say proudly, this food is Palestinian or this is Arab, that actually that wins you accolades. <laughs> um, you know, people want to see that. They want to be a part of that. People are yearning for that different way. They're not looking to the Chipotles and the, <laughs> um, you know, the big brands that are saying they're, you know, whatever they're saying, uh, that they pretend to be part of the community. So, you know, we're yeah. really trying to foster that. Yeah, I think what you said about romanticizing the food of the past um, or the food of 
our roots <laughs> um, is definitely true in the diaspora, but also, like you said, you know, the, the person from the Lebanese person tasting the Manusha in your restaurant was like, this is how it used to be in the past for them. I see a lot of that and I've only left, um, I used to live in, in, in Dubai and in, in Cairo just until a couple months ago. And we all romanticize the food of the past. And I think what you, um, what you said about um, the, the healing property of it, there is something that remedies this um, hyper robotic way of life that we have yeah. been. Um, I think it's like we're cut off from our lineage, you know, yeah. um, we're moving faster to this pace of life. And yeah. uh, particularly, I mean, even those who live there, it's like, I need to feel a part of something like, I have to have roots. <laughs> part There's of something, something. That, yeah, <laughs> I think the, the role of community and knowing each other and being connected to your neighbors, being connected to the person who runs the store, the store, you know, and uh, in, uh, right around the corner or in your building or by, you know, the end of the street. And I think there is there is that sense of bringing people together, and I and I'm I'm curious about that transition. So of course there is that continuity between both worlds. Um, what are some big lessons from your uh, social and community activism parts that you put directly into um, into your restaurant. Yeah. Um, so Reams has kind of three core values. Um, obviously, one is the community, the idea that we're all interconnected um, and that we need to rely on one another. And so everything we do, the ethos of everything we do, so that's like, everything from the neighborhoods that we're in, making sure that we um, support the communities around us, that actually helps our business because when times get tough, those are our regulars who come in day in, day out and patronize our business. Um, so that interdependency um, that we build. Um, the second is social justice. Um, we have a strong affinity for justice, right? And that means... Um, we have no tolerance for racism, classism, xenophobia, uh, patriarchy, all the things, right? We believe that the most marginalized in our communities need to come from the margins into the center. So that impacts how we hire. We make sure that we hire people from the neighborhood, people who need the jobs the most, you know, uh, working class folks, uh, black and brown folks in the in the. Um, context of my community here in Oakland, people who haven't been given a chance because of racism, right? Mm -hmm. um, it also impacts the way that we pay people. We make sure that we pay people a wage that they can thrive off of. We don't want this to um, be a place where um, we're taking advantage of or exploiting people's labor. Mm -hmm. And also uh, it impacts the way we talk about our food. We, you know, there is the anti-Arab sentiment here in the U.S. And for generations, the Arabs who've come before me have not called it Arab food. They've called it Mediterranean. They've called it, you know, even crazy like Greek. I'm like, it's not Greek food. You know, they're scared. They're scared yeah. of the backlash. And so for us, we use it as a conversation to say we are proudly Palestinian. Syri you know, this is Syrian food. This is Arab food. Um you know, we don't claim to own anything, but we want, it's a political identity that we hold. And the third is sustainability. We make sure that we pay our the farmers who grow this well. Uh, we we um, try to have zero waste. We want to be good to the earth <laughs> and the people who help us build our restaurant. So those kind of are the way that we run the business based on those three values. That's wonderful. Um really inspiring and a lot of a lot to think about um i just want to go back to something that you said was really interesting um you said something like we, there's especially perhaps in, in activism and nonprofit world there's a lot of effort and time that is spent fighting and you know saying no to a lot of things but less time or perhaps attention given to actually building the things that we want or the world that we want to so what would you want to see changed in the F and B industry? Yeah, <laughs> I know it's um, a big one. <laughs> I know that's a big one. We're trying to solve it. Um, I would love to see more 
representation of the people who are cooking the food, profiting off of the food, right? Being able to pay their families, being able to, you know, um, uh, have ownership over the narrative of their food and also the access to their food. I mean, it's crazy if you have beautiful um, representation, let's say, of Mexican fine dining, but Mexicans can't afford to have that food and they're not the ones cooking or owning those restaurants. It's or or even stuff. Mexicans working in the same restaurant. Yeah, that yeah, and they can't, can't afford, afford it. To- Yeah. So I want the people who are making the food to be able to afford to eat the food. Um, I want to see leadership of women um, who, you know, in in every culture, if you see this, are we're the ones who are cultivating the food waste, right? From generation to generation, only when it's unpaid. But as a profession, we're relegated to um, the lowest paid uh, in, in, in this industry. So, and I just have this true belief that if you invest in women in particular, we are going to cultivate more equitable food spaces, more liberatory food spaces, because we already have an ethos for, for what, you know, we already have an idea of what it is to build fair, fair, (laughs) um, spaces, right? Um, We're not. So I would like to see more of that. Um, I would love to see the communities. I want to see beautiful food in all the places that doesn't displace people around the restaurant, um, that everybody can have access to it. So those are just a few few places. But I I think at Reams, what we're trying to do um, is build this model of ownership um, profit share. So when the restaurant is thriving, the people who are working, uh, see it as, as their own, right. And they have investment in the future of it because they get a piece of profit. Right. Um, I think more spaces in FMB need to be like that. Uh, and yeah, I, I, um, just from a very meta, like meta sense, uh, less materialist, I think that if you give empower, people who've been really beat down, we create the most innovative ideas. Like that's why in the Arab world, even our food is not stagnant, right? We celebrate Mm -hmm. the past, but we invite the future. Like our food evolves. Uh, I think diaspora is the one that has the most uh, romanticized, fixed in place notion of food. But if you go to those places, people are innovating, right? And I really feel that this younger generation, if we invest in them and give them the resources. We're just going to make things even more delicious, more um, inspiring than the generations before without losing the roots. Uh, So those are the things I'd like to see. Yeah, I think, um, yes, definitely not everyone, you know, um, yeah, diaspora maybe romanticizes, but also um, I think there's a lot of creativity when the things that you need are not there. <laughs> right. So there's exactly. a lot of space and open canvas there. I think that's very exciting. Um, what you said about being a woman in the industry uh, or being women, <laughs> women chefs or women, or more women and gender representation, yeah. perhaps. Um, now the question I would ask you straight out, what is it like being a woman chef? But (laughs) the question in itself is quite loaded because then we're imposing that there's something different about being a woman when Uh, not necessarily there might be, you know. Um, There absolutely is. (laughs) Yeah, of course, especially. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was saying not because of my biological makeup, but yes, there is something different about being a woman chef and we should absolutely treat it as such. Yeah, I mean, the, I I hear some women that um, perhaps might answer the question saying, well, if I wasn't a woman, you wouldn't be asking me that question, um, which is, of course, l- legit. But at the same time, um, what you said about women innately, perhaps, or they have that ethos of feeding, uh, historically, men or the males have been privileged by their position of power, by their authority and their ability to work outdoors in the restaurant industry. Perhaps that this is what really just started this whole division, right. um, that they were able to you know, be out in the street, 
uh, work and face, you know, face the public, while women's place were usually, uh, you know, constricted to domestic places. Um, so what is it like now? <laughs> what is it like um, for you? Not not as a scene, but for you, how did you feel? Do, how do you feel the difference? Yeah. Well, um, I, I think representation matters. So the fact that there are not a lot of women in the industry, I'm immediately going to be an anomaly. Um, there is uh, there are implications no matter how successful you are. I mean, I I was in my fine dining restaurant. People walk right past me looking for the owner mm. or the chef, right? The idea of what a chef is. It's always masculine. It's always male. You couldn't be that, right? And it's because what people see, right? And what they equate. And that is uh, systemic. Uh, and it's, you know, r racism is like hard to pinpoint because so much of it is structural. And what people see as a chef uh, in this case in particular. Um, but I think, yeah, it it is very hard, uh, I guess, is the easy way to answer that question. Um, not because I can't do my job well, uh, but because I have to work 10 times harder to do my job well than my male counterparts. So in the field of getting money, right, um, getting investors to invest in my vision, I have to have a 10 year track record. Yet, you know, this the chef next to me can have a great idea and get a check in the next week. Right. And I saw that over and over again, we've had to build reams from the grassroots. So it, inevitably it's going to be harder for me to be successful because I don't have that edge. Um, and then, then people see that they're like, Oh, how cute, you know, she can't, she's just doing this small thing. It's like, yeah, because I don't have the investment to get the fancy chairs or, you know, the HR department that, the other chef can get. So it's like, it it's on top of each other. And then you put race on top of that. I'm a Brown woman, you know, not just a, uh, a white woman who can, you know, project my influence. Um, and it's a whole other game. Uh, so I've had to navigate that. I've had to navigate internalized that I can't do it. Um, imposter syndrome as they would call it, which is also, a very, very systemic thing uh, designed to make uh, women, to make, uh, you know, people. people of color believe that they can't do it. Um, that keeps us from really thriving for more. And I've had to fight that. Even with all my accolades, I still feel like I'm not worthy sometimes of being in these spaces with um, super accomplished uh, males in the industry because um, of what I've had to experience being in those places. And I see that now in my employees, right? They are like, we were never told, asked what we feel or that we have authority over, you know, the space and the food. And so it prevents them from being leaders. So we've had to just navigate so much. I've had to navigate so many more barriers um, to being, successful and even when I'm successful it's hard um to absorb that how is it like for um the the woman or female um staff that you have <laughs> how is it ha how has that shaped your relationship with them perhaps or what yeah. would you do? I'm sure it's it's uh there's a lot that especially carrying through your um your community work before and your uh, labor equity um, uh, passion. I'm sure there's a lot that you also are very conscious about. Yeah, I mean, I just think having a, a brown woman leader to look up to, they're like, if she can do it, I can do it too. There's something to be said about that, right? And even the way I am in the public with other aspiring women who want to get into the food world, like if they see more people like me, it's going to be easier and more motivating for them. So inside and outside my restaurant, just me being in a position of leadership, I think matters. Um, but also we don't have any, I have men and women in my, I mean, just, uh, you know, the, the industry does attract a lot of men, but I think because of the culture we've created that really um, has no 
<laughs> patience for patriarchy, it's going to attract a certain type of person, even the male mm-hmm. uh, who who understands and steps back. So it's very matriarchal <laughs> in my spaces. Like the women are the leaders uh, just by nature of that, because we're attracting a certain type of person with va- a certain type of values. And that allows them to speak their mind, uh, to be a little less shy. um, And that's great. Um, We're building those kind of healthy places for them to step up uh, to the plate. That's wonderful. Um, How was it like running a restaurant through the pandemic? (laughs) You really want to bring me back to my trauma? (laughs) Well, alhamdulillah, salama, you know. Um, I hope things um, are better now. Yes and no. Um, I think that there is a very, uh, you know, reality that we're in the aftermath of the pandemic, which may have even more ramifications for us Mm -hmm. than the pandemic itself. Um, What was scary, what was scary to run a restaurant in the midst of the pandemic was literally people were dying around us. Uh, not to mention, you know, we were trying to survive as a restaurant, but like literally we couldn't control the safety of our employees. We were all essential workers and we were working when everybody else was at home. So that was scary. Mm. Um, I had the misfortune of opening my second, uh, my third restaurant three days before the shutdown. So people didn't know about Reams. Um, that's a picture of my staff there. <laughs> and all of it, we had hired all the staff and I couldn't get, I couldn't get myself to lay off anybody. Um, so we had to survive. And so we did everything. Uh, our model changed mm. in the blink of an eye, you know, on our Oakland side, we were feeding hundreds and thousands of people uh, through world central kitchen. We were, uh, um, we were provided, you know, a stipend to pay, you know, and that allowed us to keep all of our workers employed should they want want to be. So we were no longer a restaurant. Um, we did meal kits, meal kit programs for people who were sheltering at home. We were back at the farmer's markets. We were doing delivery. We were doing everything. And um, I think it really exhausted us, but we did it. Um, was it fun? No, not really. But um, out of it came this deep sense of resilience that like if we could survive in a pandemic, we can survive through anything. And, um, you know, a lot of that staff you see in that picture are still working with me. And you can't say the same for other restaurants who decided to throw in the towel. Yeah, Uh, that is more costly. That felt a little bit more costly for me to have to retrain over and over. And people are talking about a uh, shortage of employees in the industry. And, you know, we're not experiencing that. In fact, we're, we're experiencing what's harder is that we're in the midst of a recession and people are not, and the cost of supplies have gone up and we have to charge more for our food. And we're dealing with food racism, right? That people were like, oh, Arab street food, I shouldn't have to pay $6 for a menu. Well, the price of flour has tripled, you know, the living wage and to be able to survive in San Francisco, we have to pay these wages. Our rent is this much. We're not making really much off of that man, Ushe, even though it's $6. <laughs> uh, so to have to um, educate our customer about the, pr- the, the price of food in this new reality is much harder than it was in the pandemic. In the pandemic, People are like, we're all in this together. Support your businesses. Mm. And now in the aftermath of the pandemic, people have forgotten. Uh, so yeah, this is a new reality that we live in and we're trying to navigate in it the best way we can. And um, But things have gotten better. I mean, it feels so nice to have people in our restaurant and to see people eat our food. I mean, I cried the first time we were oh. able to open our doors again, watching somebody eat you know, bite into their men. Oh, we had missed that. So, um, yeah, in, in that way, it's much better because Arab hospitality is really about that human connection that we couldn't have. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot of um, sense of giving without expectations, without a return necessarily that comes in through the Arab culture and the, the 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 notion of generosity and hospitality and all that. Like you just give, but of course being a business. Yeah. <laughs> how do you at do the end that? of the day. Uh-huh. Um I there's what you said about 
the value of food, the value of street food, but the value of Arab food specifically. Like, why would someone pay six dollars for a manouche? But then, I don't know. Um, you could you could have a twenty dollar bowl of spaghetti, <laughs> exactly, or fifty dollars for a yeah. bowl of spaghetti, exactly. And and then not even in a in, <laughs> in a, not in a, any kind of fancy restaurant at all. Oh. Um, so. How would one go about that sense of educating the audience? They write a cookbook. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I mean, I'm part of yes. it. I always laugh like my grandmother, my teta, could do circles around some of these Michelin star uh, chefs who think they have the techniques. But, you know, the techniques of fermentation and preservation you know, those have lived in our cultures for centuries. We've needed them to survive, right? Mm -hmm. They're not just like this fun thing that, uh, you know, some some fancy chef could pick up and then make a lot of money off of. Um, so, yeah, I think part of it is talking about how we cook our food. Everything from Reams is made from scratch. You know, we, we don't... Um, you know, our, our bread is fermented 48 hours with a, you know, starter that we make and we have cultivated over the last six, seven years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the flour that we get is milled <laughs> locally. It's that that's the California love. You know, we we talk about kind of all of the the steps that have gone into making um, this food possible for people. So we do that a lot with our servers who are educated in kind of what, what we do and, and talk to the customers. Um, you know, I wrote a book, uh, Arabia, that really talks about, hopefully can see the technique um, that is, yeah. you know, like uh, just because we have simple rest, um, simple ingredients doesn't mean there's not technique to making those those dishes really beautiful and exquisite um and also just the making using good ingredients i think people don't realize you know and and i understand because a lot of the mom and pop shops they can't survive so they've had to shortcut it or use canned tomatoes or whatnot um but we really try to show that in the arab world we cook seasonally <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that our food is really based on what is cultivated on the land and mm. that's why the land is so important to us right because we are actually in essence a rural people <laughs> um so yeah we talk about the history um of how how arabs cook and yeah ho hopefully we're changing people's perception of that but it's it, it is quite an endeavor no, it's uh, it's very interesting. I think that the the angle of uh, of an Arab in the diaspora part is really interesting, and just from the title itself, Arabia, you know, there's yeah. a lot of emphasis on identity, yeah. um, and I love that. I love how it comes through the book. Um, Intersectionality of identity, right? Like that's yes. was really important. Like, don't put me in a box. What do you think of when you think of Arabia? And I'm gonna turn all of that up on its head <laughs> if you read I'll this show book. you what that of is <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> that's wonderful I think um how how might have the book been different had you been in the Arab world and not uh a diaspora not in the diaspora yeah nobody has ever asked me that question that's a great question um I think that my sense is that uh, women in the Arab world are estranged from their place too and have intersectionality of identity too mm. in this new global era of social media and all these projects also going back to roots and reclaiming land. Um, and so I would like to imagine even if I was there, I'd be searching for answers mm. in the same way. Um, I think the being a diaspora, the added layer that I have in this book is really about celebrating cultures that Arabs and diaspora intersect with in mm -hmm. meaningful, organic ways that maybe I wouldn't have had if I was just living in the Arab world, right? I wouldn't have yeah. had access to. 
So the idea that, you know, I've learned about Arabs, you know, immigrating to um, Central America and Mexico and bringing the shawarma over and that turned into al pastor and tacos arabes. Um, I wouldn't have learned that if I hadn't had, you know, Mex uh, intersected with Lat Latinx community and in in Oakland or my employees who are cooking my food. Mm. They're like, oh yeah, we have that. What was that about? Mm. Um, it wouldn't happen if I was living in the U.S. Uh, in a suburb and my mom couldn't access Arab bread, so she had to use tortillas to make mm. our <laughs> yeah. wraps, you know, so the fact that Arabs have had to adapt wherever they go, and that's mm. evolved into maybe um, crossed over into other people's food ways, um, that's something to be celebrated. And so I'm fascinated with Arabs uh, in every place that they go, how they impact the community's food ways around them, and vice versa, how those communities have impacted their food ways. Yeah. Um, what do you think of Arab food in the scene now? I mean, there's a lot of street food. We know that in the U.S. Uh, perhaps I'm talking about in, in North America specifically. Yeah. The scene of Arab yeah, food? Yeah, Arab food. Yeah, Arab food scene. Yeah. So, has there yeah. been much changes, any shifts in how there's yeah. a lot of food trucks, you know, and, and there's a lot of perhaps a, a, a misconception that it's just um, boxed within that category? Yeah, about uh, hummus and falafel and shawarma, right? That's like yeah. the, in fact, that was going to be our tagline uh, at Reams, not just your hummus and falafel or something like that. But then yeah. go figure, we sell hummus and falafel. They're great. <laughs> um, But there's the beyond. And we'll yeah, talk beyond about the, the hummus and falafel, the manusha, right? And yeah. so I wanted to, show the breadth and depth of Arab cuisine. Um, mm. That's what we embarked to do back in 2014 when I opened Reams. And I would like to say that we were pioneers of that. You know, when you look at the food scene now and what's hot, mm. uh, people are using the word Arab cuisine. They never used to say Arab cuisine. People are saying Palestinian cuisine. That never yes. used to be the case, right? Um, the Israelis took over that space, right? And they branded it as their own, right? That was kind of the thing that we were fighting against. Instead of fighting against it, I wanted to just reclaim. Um, and and that, that reclamation, I think, has trickled uh, into other people saying, oh, I don't know why. Maybe like, okay, now it's safe for me to do that. Yeah. Or that's cool. I want to jump on that bandwagon for whatever reason, <laughs> You know, things like the manusha are becoming more staple items. And that's what I wanted. You know, I wanted the future. To, I wanted the manusha to be as common, um, but also have a place of a story behind it. Not, not just a manusha that people don't know what the roots of it are. So I wanted to include, uh, introduce it to the American public in that way. Um, and I think you, you see a lot more restaurants selling the manusha, talking about the manusha, uh, Uh, I love, I love. Every, every, yeah, I mean, it's amazing, right? It should be the pizza slice or the um, the burrito here It in California. It is so underestimated or just yeah. not known, you know? Yeah. I'm waiting for that time in this near future yeah. <laughs> where it will be in the spotlight and people are going to go crazy over it. I know yeah, it. But it has been written about in Bon Appetit now and, for, you know, these mainstream yeah. things for better or for worse, right? Um, and it better come from us, the 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 folks who uh, are rooted in that that food, right? Yeah. Rather than these kind of more whitewashed places putting manusha on the menu, you see zaatar and summa and all of these ingredients. They're being de-ethnicized, right? You see hummus and Trader Joe's. You don't. It doesn't have story. It doesn't have root. And so what I see in the scene is more people um, of Arab descent or in diaspora or connected to the Arab world in a meaningful way, actually talking about the food. And that to me is hopeful. Yeah. Um, talking about the from, Yeah, go ahead. No, no, please. Oh, I was, I was saying say... everywhere from the small, small store to yeah. the um the fine dining restaurant. You know, you have you have Arab chefs now who are taking up those spaces. So I I feel there's still 
a small amount, <laughs> but at least, you know, we're out there and people are noticing what we're doing. Yes. You're doing us proud. Um, and, and the book I think is, there's a lot of, it's a labor of love, I'm sure. And there's a, a lot that um, is very important when it comes to educating. Again, like we do see the Zata and Trader Joe's, uh, but then the use of pe- because because it has been so far removed from its roots, like you said, people don't even know how to use it. Uh, I've got a number of friends who would you know text me like, what do I make with Zata? What do I put it on? You know, and of course it's <laughs> it's a legitimate question, but then through educating and what you're doing um, is really great because then it would solve that question and then it would become um, a, a true and authentic and, and, and correct uh, use and, 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 and um, perhaps, um, you know, it, it does, um, it does homage to where it came from um, and avoids a whole other route of appropriation and misuse and all that. Um, what was the process of writing the book like? Uh, how long did it take you? Um, from start to finish and putting the proposal together, almost three years. Wow. Yeah, it was a labor of love. This is a you know 300 page book and um, I wrote it. I had. I was lucky to have um, my aunt helped me write it. Um, it was in the midst of the pandemic. I, if I didn't have an accountability partner, <laughs> it would have been very hard. Um, but you know, it's like anything. You put your heart on a paper, and the pub, and the world is going to see it. And it's very much um, autobiographical. It's not just the story about the food, but the story of me and my evolution, um, finding food as a way of, to my own path of healing and social justice and transformation. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not, uh, it's not traditional. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So there, you know, a lot of it was like testing and like, I'm not afraid to put Zatar on my popcorn or whatever, you know, like I, um, so that was fun and also nerve wracking. Like I wanted to make sure these recipes work. You, uh, I've seen a lot of cookbooks where I know that the the authors and or whoever their copy editors didn't test the recipes out. Um, so it was very important to me to create something that people can really use, yeah, experience what they've experienced in my restaurants, right, in their own homes, and to make it accessible. Not to make it, I, you know, there's obviously a huge baking section in there, and where I get to show off some of my expertise, but. Um, there you go. <laughs> See, the grandma level is the advanced technique, yes. right? <laughs> um, but, but, but this is a makeshift massage, right? This is yeah, not it's a walk turned over. Yeah, it's um, okay. and I wanted to make it accessible to people because I feel like in so many um Middle Eastern cookbooks, they just skip over the bread and they don't really talk about it, and that's the centerpiece of our cuisine. So I really wanted to make sure people had as many tools as they could to to master that component of the cuisine. So for those of um, of us listening and not watching, if you're listening, um, Reem, what would you do to create this makeshift sage um, so that we, we can make, I don't know, manoush, man, manisha, oh, excuse me. <laughs> manoush, manisha <laughs> on al sage, yeah. What, yeah. What, how would we so go about that? So a sage is essentially a convex uh, flipped over walk. Um, walks are um, a traditional, um, what's it called? Like stir fry for uh, Asian cuisine. Yeah. Um, you can buy them at any, you know, small Korean or Japanese store. They sell them the kitchen stores, any, a lot of the kitchen stores sell them yeah. and they're awesome for sauteing things. Um, yeah. but you flip them over, you can, it's a makeshift sage, or you can flip a cast iron, um, pan over anything that creates a little bit of space between the flame, um, and the bread. Oh. So that you get that nice crisp on the bottom of the bread, but also the nice doughy, pillowy, you know, taste of the manushe on the inside. This is and this great. Is yeah. bread, so you can flip it over, you can do it on one side and then just top it. Or you can, um, as I'm doing here, you can see in the picture, um, flipping over the bread and getting toast on both sides. 
That's wonderful. Um, I'll definitely try that out. I'll go. I'll go and buy a, a walk. <laughs> yeah. I actually, in fact, live very close to Chinatown here in Toronto. So, yeah, yeah. Good one. awesome. Um, we asked you to pick one ingredient yeah. uh, to talk us uh, through it or tell us more about it, and you chose ashta. Mm-hmm. Ashta. <laughs> what is ashta? And why ashta? Um. You know, Ashta, I would say, is like the King Midas of Arab desserts. <laughs> you can use it, you can eat it alone, you can eat it um, as part of desserts, but it's a clotted, essentially a clotted cream. And for me, it's like a really magical um, ingredient because of the technique that people use. So if you imagine that um, nice film on like nice rich milk that that forms when it's sitting warm, Imagine you taking off that nice creamy film over and over again until you get this really just rich, creamy goodness. That's what ashta is. Mm. Uh, and we use it um, in, you know, uh, filo, like uh, filo desserts. We use it in kanafe. We use it on its own. <laughs> Um, yes. And then we drizzle honey and pistachios on it. It's, oh. You know, we stuff it in atayef. It's just like so versatile uh, in terms of uh, a dessert. Uh, and you can eat it savory too. Um, but in the cookbook, I do, uh, you know, in Lebanon, you see them in huge vats where they're making this. You can slowly do it in your oven, but um, in the cookbook, I make a short version uh a shortcut version of it where you curdle the cream with a oh wow so you, so you have milk. that recipe on how to to make it from scratch from just yeah. milk yeah mm -hmm. milk milk and um you curdle it you, okay. so you sweeten it um so the yeah. ashta is like slightly sweet not too sweet and then um you put a, a lemon lemon juice in it and uh that's the curdle factor yeah, the curdle factor. So it separates the fat of the milk from, so it just speeds up that process. Um, and then you kind of thicken it a little bit with some cornstarch. And then you add a little bit of uh, orange blossom and rose water. So it has that um, really yes. amazing. I'd know. love me some ashta and some rice pudding, maybe. Yes, yes. That texture is just so delicious and luxurious. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll jump into a quick fun Q and A, and ask you what are you reading and watching right now? Doesn't have to be related to food at all. Uh huh. Um, what did I just watch? Uh, the menu. If anybody's oh, seen that on HBO yes. Max, it's a horror story of a <laughs> the restaurant. I still really, have not really watched. It. Everyone's going crazy over yeah. it, You're loving it or yeah. hating it, but. Yeah, I my you can see my humor and uh, the darkness of my humor with what I watch. I'm watching only murders in the building right now, which is a fun thing on Netflix. Uh, no, not Hulu. <laughs> what am I reading? I it's it. I'm reading Bell Hooks all about love. I'm kind of a <laughs> something that I read all the time, and I'm going back to these days. Nice. Who would you love to shadow for one day? Oh, who would I love to? You know, I never really thought about this. Could uh, be someone from your past, history, uh, general, or just the present. Yeah. I would love to see, I just more out of curiosity, um, what like J Lo's life is like. I know that's a very <laughs> that is very random. I love it. it is very random, but like I have these, I'm like, what do what do these like really rich people with like really good looking husbands and they do philanthropy and they you know and they're working hard still. What what is that life like? I wanna what's their wanna night know. routine like? Yeah, what is <laughs> what does she do to keep her skin that beautiful? <laughs> love that. Um, all right. What's your guilty midnight food choice? Guilty pleasure. Other than us, of course. Uh, potato chips or sour candy mm -hmm. <laughs> or chocolate. <laughs> I have a lot of guilty midnight pleasures. 
I like the um, the peach sour can the peach hearts the uh -huh. sour peach oh, hearts. Yeah. Yeah. To those. Um, and what dish reminds you most of home? What what do you consider as home? That's a very elusive thing. Uh, yeah, home, wherever my mom is. <laughs> so what's what's a dish that reminds you of her? Of her, um, I would say msakhan. Yes. We would make that a lot for us. Mm -hmm. um, or the smell of um, like chicken stew, like frike or something. She oh. likes to make, you know, nice uh, Arabic style chicken stews for us all the time. That is so, you know, when you said chicken stew, I remember that whenever my mom would cook, of course, anything would have chicken broth in it yep. somehow, either yep. the rice or, yep. or any stew that she's making, yeah. you know? So there's the, the, the smell of the, yeah, of the, the chicken broth with the, a little bit of cardamom, a little bit of bay leaf and some yeah. mastic also. Oh, yeah. Mastic. yeah, yeah. If I smell that any time, I know that there's going to be good food. Exactly. It just oh. reminds me of home. Good point. Good point. <laughs> oh, or herbs, like lots of herbs, like I'm like a fatouche or a tabbouleh or something. Like when I smell a lot of lemon and herbs, I'm like, oh, that's an Arab household or we're going, I'm going to have some good, good salad. Yes. Fresh uh, nana, I think. Nana. Fresh nana. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Reem, this has been really such a pleasure talking to you. Um, I'm just conscious about the time. Unfortunately, it's been really nice chatting that we ran a little bit over time. We don't have uh, a few more minutes, I believe, for um, Q&A. But if there are any of you listening out there and if you have any questions, please just reach out, comment or send us uh, an email or follow Reem and reach out to her directly uh, on either Reem's California Instagram account or reem.asil uh, also on Instagram. Um, other than that, I'd like to really thank you, Reem, so much for joining us today. It was lovely meeting you in person. And uh, for any of you here, follow us uh, on Africa. Let us know how we did today and we'd love to hear more from you. Thank you, Reem. Thanks for having me.